sectors. Um, I invite Mr. Raghavan to please come and tell us a little bit about what Agastya does. So what makes you creative or innovative? What makes you a great problem solver? Is it something in your genes or a skill that you've learned? When Einstein was five years old and ill in bed, his father brought him a gift, a magnetic compass. The five-year-old Einstein was fascinated because whichever way he held it, it always pointed in the same direction, northward. It was a momentous gift, huh? Einstein remarked years later that it was the magnetic compass that made him wonder that there must be an invisible, a deeply hidden force behind everything in the universe. And as we know, he dedicated his life to finding it. Now, I know what you're thinking. Do I have to be Einstein to be creative? So let's fast forward more than a century later to rural India, Kuppam, two and a half hours by road from here. Two village girls, Rani and Roja, sat under a tree to escape the sun, a sensible thing to do in the Indian summer. And they began chatting, and Rani looked at Roja and asked, you know, Roja, do you ever wonder why do you feel cool or cooler sitting in the shade of a tree? And Roja thought for a second, said, yeah, well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that the leaves and branches of the tree are shielding us from the sun. And they continued talking about this until the aha question popped out. Would different leaves have different cooling effects? Now, that question led to a project titled The Cooling Effect of Leaves. And nine months later, working with instructors from the Augustia Foundation, the girls won a prestigious Intel Iris National Science Award, competing with the best and brightest kids from across India. Is this an exceptional story? Well, around the same time, two kids in North Karnataka, Pavitra and Sainath, used to go home for their vacations, a place known for groundnut farming. And they would see these mountains of groundnut shells piled up. And one day, Pavitra asked the question, can these shells be used to do something, you know, produce something? And the kids thought about it. Sainath happened to go home, watch his grandmother cooking something, and he said, hey, grandma, what are you cooking? She said, I'm cooking your favorite lady's finger. He was watching that, and he realized that the lady's finger produced a sort of glue that could possibly be used to make a paste out of the groundnut shells and hold it together. So they created a project and made paper out of the groundnut shells. And an entrepreneur from an adjoining district heard about it and said, you know, I'd like to learn this technology so I can use my groundnut shell waste and produce something of value. So what do we learn from these stories? I think what you learn is the power of curiosity, the spirit of inquiry, the need to observe deeply, whatever you do, the magic of wonder and the power of passion. Now, Einstein attributed his uh, incredible insights to curiosity, obsession, and dogged endurance. The mission of Augustia, the foundation that I had, is to spark curiosity and creativity in economically disadvantaged children and rural teachers across India. And we're doing this, working with about a million children a year through mobile science labs. We have 75 mobile science labs that go around 10 states in India, small science centers, about 30 of them, and a 172-acre campus in Kuppam, two hours by road from here, that we call our creativity lab. So how did we get here? when I quit my job in 1998, the year of the nuclear explosions. I had a dream of building a school for creative leaders in the Himalayas. So I came back to India full of juice. We're going to build a school and got a group of people together, the former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, a former principal of the Daily College in uh, Indore, the former principal of Rishi Valley School, college students, school students, people from industry, and we ask questions like, is it possible to raise the speed limit of creativity in a country? Or is it a contradiction in terms? And even if it were possible, how would we go about doing it? And we came up with a model. We said, look, creative people, great problem solvers, innovative people tend to observe very deeply. There's a process of 
awareness, a gestation in their brains. They have the capacity to integrate, associate different strands of information and to apply it to produce something of value for society. But all of this thing, these things are predicated on curiosity. If you're not curious, you're not going to observe. You're not going to be that aware of, integrate information or apply it for useful ends. So let the mission of our foundation be to spark curiosity. And we said, look, you know, the Indian education system is very lopsided. It's all I talk, you listen kind of education. There's very little of the creative spark in education. So if we can inject that, then that would bring about possibly some transformation. So Dr. Iyengar, the former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission said, you know, Ramji, your ideas are great, but rather than build a school, let's try and find a way of disseminating this to the masses. Because that is something where we, as scientists and policymakers, have dismally failed in disseminating the scientific temper to the masses of India. So we said, okay, forget about the school. Rather than fill a bucket, let's look at how we can raise the level of the ocean, even by a millimeter. So we look for programs to disseminate to the masses. Almost the first thing we did in our excitement was to buy 200 acres of barren, rocky wasteland in Kuppa. And that was the good news. The bad news was we ran out of money, right? And we were under a lot of pressure to build the Taj Mahal on the campus. We didn't have the money, so we did what we were good at. We huddled and started brainstorming. And somebody said, look, maybe we've got this wrong. While we wait for the money to build the buildings to attract children and teachers to the campus, let's take education out to the villages. How? How about a mobile science lab? So I got a friend to loan us a second-hand vehicle from uh, Hindustan Motors. Balram, our tractor driver, became the first mobile lab instructor, and we set him loose in the villages. The response was fantastic. I asked Balram, how's it going? He said, they love it. The children really love it. They're engaged. They're participating. And you know what? He said, I didn't realize how much fun it could be to be a teacher. Now, this guy was a bachelor in arts, not even a BSc, right? But he was trained, a smart guy. So the mobile lab became our first sort of initiative into the hinterland. And that became the vehicle to launch another initiative at scale, the Village Science Fair. And we had the traditional model of training teachers to teach all these experiments to visiting village children. And one day, to our horror, we ran out of teachers. There weren't enough teachers prepared to teach these experiments on a Sunday. And we were saved this time by a couple of uh, village girls who came up to us and said, look, you don't have enough teachers, right? Right? How about if you trained us to be your teachers? And we've got 100 friends who'd be really interested. It seemed like an outrageous idea, but we went ahead and did it. And uh, it turned out to be a huge success because the visiting kids saw not gray-haired men like me with sullen expressions waiting to teach them science, right? But kids their own age, full of enthusiasm and really wanting to show off in front of them. So this became what we call our Young Instructor Leader Program of Children Teaching Children, Peer-to-Peer -peer Instruction, one of our most transformative uh, initiatives. Over the years, the mobile labs and the science fairs, which you'll see on the film, led to the creation of an ecosystem for hands-on science education. So we're in the process of creating that in Karnataka, where we're building a campus in Raichur, four of five large science centers in different districts. And then we've got these mini science centers, the mobile labs, and now a lab in a box, and even a lab on a bike. And we are trying to take this model and spread it across different states of India. In fact, the National Knowledge Commission sent a group to see our work and said, you know, maybe we should find a way of uh, scaling it up across India. But what is it that we are trying to achieve? What we are trying to do is bring about key shifts in behavior. The first shift is the shift from yes to why, to get people to start asking questions about whatever they see or hear. The second is the shift from looking to observing. The third is the shift from being very passive to learning to explore, Ella Rani and Roja and Pavitra and Sainath. The fourth is from being very textbook bound to being more hands-on. And finally, the most important shift from fear to confidence, 
But as we all know, there's a lot of fear in the classrooms. People are afraid to ask questions. I mean, there's a lot of fear in society in general. As we know, people are afraid to question the powers that be. But we are looking at education. So how can we bring about that transformation, that sense of confidence? I remember visiting a village school years ago, trying to understand the impact we were having. And I asked the teacher, you know, kids have been coming to our campus, any impact? And she pointed to a tall girl, Uma, and said, she's become a real leader. So I went up to Uma and said, Uma, what difference have we made to your life? And she said, she, or rather, she didn't say, you know, I'm doing physics better, or chemistry, or biology, or math, although she was apparently a very good student. You know what she said? She said, sir, after Augustia, I'm not afraid to speak anymore. And that's when I realized that perhaps what we were doing through our many interventions was not just education, but a kind of inward transformation, a sense of confidence, self-esteem, self-worth. Now, Uma, it turns out, became the first girl from her village to join an engineering college, and her example inspired many of her friends, girls from the villages, to join college, right? So what lessons can you take from our experience at Augusta? Well, the first obvious one, and she talked about it, is catch them young, because education is easier than re-education. We have a huge problem in this country and all over the world getting people in their 20s and 30s and trying to retrain them and reskill them and all the rest of it. It can be done, but it takes a lot of heartache, a lot of initiative, a lot of money. The second is that creative learning may be a luxury for the rich, but it's absolutely essential for the poor because the kinds of constraints and challenges they face, if you're not creative, not innovative, you're not going to bring about changes to your environment, to your society. The third, and that's the good news, is that transformation is not that difficult. To bring about transformation, you have to influence the sorts of changes that I talked about earlier. And you have to be able to create stimulating environments, environments where children, teachers, adults can learn to experiment, to explore, to be curious. So when people ask me, what is your vision for Augustia? What's your mission for that matter? Our vision is really a nation of curious people, right? So I will end on that note and pass you over to the film. Thank you.